need to do is focus on the Nexus. They just need to focus on the Nexus. And yes, the Ever Challenger team from Korea will take out TS. On March 4th of 2016, a shocking upset happened in the world of League of Legends esports. During an early match at IEM Katowice, North American favorites TSM threw a massive lead against what was essentially a challenger Korean team named ESC Ever. At one point, TSM had a 6,000 gold lead alongside a 10 to 1 kill advantage and were knocking on the door of Ever's inhibitors while Ever had taken virtually no objectives of their own, yet in spite of this dismal situation, Situation, ESC Ever came back to win this game in what was both a shocking and hilarious upset. Now, generally speaking, League of Legends fans use a specific word to describe matches like these. They'll say it was a throw. This was a circumstance of one team taking what should have been an easy win, and instead of finishing the job, they threw the victory over to their opponent. But today I want you to erase that word from your memory just for this video and try to view things in a slightly different light. This wasn't a throw, this was a comeback. As badly as TSM had to play to lose this match, Ever had to play incredibly well to win it. It's a really impressive thing when a team is put in a situation where they're staring at an inevitable loss, yet they refuse to give up. Because of the snowball-y nature of League, being on the losing side of a match is almost depressing, but in spite of that, some teams still find a way to keep on playing with the same vigor they started the game off with and find a way to win anyway. And through that lens, there's a very interesting question we can ask. What was the greatest comeback that's ever happened in League? It's a tougher question to answer than you might first think, since different comebacks can happen in different ways. Some teams might come back from huge gold deficits, while others make turnarounds happen after nearly losing their nexus. It's hard to rank and compare the magnitude between these kinds of matches, but we're going to try and do that a bit today. I've identified what I believe are the three greatest comebacks in League of Legends history, and today I'm going to tell you the story of each and every Every one of them. I don't think I can pick a personal favorite myself, but if you want to crown a greatest of all time, you can do so in the comments down below once the video is over. Whichever you might personally like the most though, these three games were some of the best professional League of Legends matches we have ever seen, period. I'm excited to show you all of them, but before we jump in, I have to give a quick shout out to our sponsor. This video is brought to you by Surfshark VPN. I spend almost all day every day sitting at my computer. I know you guys do too, don't try to deny it. When you spend so much time on the internet, one of the best tools that you really should be using if you aren't already is a VPN. I love using VPNs myself to access region locked content, whether that be for learning languages or just watching anime with Netflix Japan. But of course, VPNs can do so much more than just that. Everything from masking your IP, allowing you to avoid DDoS attacks to encrypting your data and protecting you from any sort of unwanted spying entities, whether you just to use the internet safely on public Wi-Fi or give yourself an extra layer of protection, a VPN is really crucial to browsing the modern web safely today, and Surfshark is pretty much the best option you have out there. Compared to all the other VPNs, none provide all the features and benefits that Surfshark does, allowing you to do things like use a single account on an unlimited number of devices. Not only that, but they can be one of the cheapest options out there too if you just use the link in the description to sign up. Just click down below and enter the promo code GBay99 at checkout and you will get 83% off your order plus three months free. That is an incredibly good deal and also supports our channel and the content we make. So thanks again to Surfshark for supporting us. But now back to the video. Throughout the history of European League of Legends, you would be hard pressed to find a team more beloved than Unicorns of Love. This squad who first emerged back in Season 5 quickly became a fan favorite, and it's easy to see why given their name. In a time when esports were trying to become more and more mainstream, with leagues that looked more and more professional, it was refreshing to see a team that didn't take itself so intensely seriously. But this team was more than just a well-branded organization, they were legitimate contenders, containing many of Europe's future rising stars. Kikis and Vizachachi, for example, were talented pros who made up some of the backbone of this team, playing alongside future household names like Power of Evil and Hillisong, who of course are so talented they're still playing on top squads today. In spite of their rookie status, this roster was filled to the brim with skilled players who had the potential to win titles with ease. Honestly, Unicorns of Love were such an interesting team, they kind of deserve their own documentary, but I want to focus on one specific game they played 
played during their very first split in the EU LCS. This game took place on week 8 of the 2015 spring season, just one week before playoffs began. Most teams at the time were either fighting for playoff spots or trying to get better seeding, and Unicorns of Love were no exception. At the end of week 7, they were just barely holding on to the last playoff bid and were hoping to secure a spot in the postseason this week, but they still had some tough competition standing in their way. More specifically, here in Week 8, they had to go up against Fnatic, the favorites to win it all. This Best of One series was one of the first big tests for Unicorns of Love, measuring how good the squad actually was and if they could perform in high-stakes situations under pressure. Fnatic were a team filled with veteran stars by comparison and had everything going for them, as most rookie teams typically struggle pretty heavily when going up against dynasties like this. But Unicorns put on what would go down in the history books as a magical performance. When the match began, Unicorns of Love hit the ground running and reminded everyone why they were such a hyped up team. They started off by executing a successful lane swap that got their top laner a massive CS advantage, where shortly after that they also managed to coordinate taking the first dragon, get loads of map control, and even got first blood. But like any rookie team, they soon began to show their flaws, and the veteran Fnatic squad began to exploit those a bit. On this champion for him, I think he's gonna go for it again now. He has the TL ready. That could be his next oh, pickup. But now he catches game. two! The shard catches them both! Power of Evil's down! Fnatic, look for Hillisan! He's down! Fnatic got a few picks here or there to even out the kills before then catching back up in CS to even out the gold, and even ended up taking the next dragon as well to get all the momentum back on their side. This painted a pretty dismal portrait for Unicorns of Love, as this is a story League of Legends fans know pretty well. Well, rookie superstar teams in League of Legends oftentimes look really promising early on in a game, a series, or even a whole season before they eventually choke under pressure when placed against veteran squads. We oftentimes see really talented teams who might be better than all the opponents they face, but if they ever go up against a team that just has a better mental state due to veteran status, they oftentimes choke under pressure and are unable to win when it matters. It looked like that's exactly what's happening here, as Unicorns of Love showed great talent, but were quickly falling behind as Fnatic exploited plenty of weaknesses they had. But something interesting happened next. Unicorns didn't give up. Even though they were quickly falling further and further behind and starting to lose the game pretty hard, they kept on trying to find ways to make aggressive plays, go for kills, and look for openings as if they were still in the lead. This was an impressive showing of mental fortitude for such a young team, and although this aggressive movement did end up hurting them more often than it probably helped, it showed that they weren't going down without a fight. For the most part, Fnatic continued to get more picks, more kills, more objectives, and extended their lead for a while, but Unicorns did have one major success in the mid game. Lava putting some poke down. Yellow Star eats the ace in the hole, throws out the dredge line. They've got Power of Evil. He did get the stun down. The petrifying gaze was out. Fnatic need to be careful. They're low on HP as Baron helps to at least put some damage on the back line, but it's a two for zero. No, no, now Rainover's here. <laughs> Rainover's here. Got Smite available. He's down. Absolutely. Gotta kill the Nunu. channel. Baron is still alive. Baron, no, it's Yuri that goes down. Nunu taken out as Yellow Star and Steelback look to clean up the house. After a pretty messy fight, Unicorns have lost managed to sneak a Baron, where two of their characters died in taking it, but they would get the Baron-empowered minion buff on three of their champions, which they then turned into taking an inhibitor mid lane. UOL were actually taking so many objectives for this little stretch here that they evened up the gold and even got a slight lead later on, but sadly for Unicorns, that would be the last time they were leading in gold all game. Kick is... Well, one guy. Hey, you're not wrong. Two, oh, Chachi's two. caught up by Febivin. What can Chachi do? Omen of oh death, yeah. not available, so unable to ult himself. Right. Is it Baron time again? During what was essentially a pretty unimportant dragon fight, UOL would overcommit to trying to take the objective, which resulted in two of their characters dying. This gave Fnatic a lead in gold that they wouldn't throw for the rest of the match, which allowed them to then rotate over to Baron, taking it for free before putting their foot back on the gas pedal as they started trying to close out the game. Just a few minutes later, Fnatic were 
ready to push down, start a fight, and try and finish this match off, UOL needed to be really careful here, as a single bad team fight would likely cost them the game, but unfortunately, that was right when they made their biggest mistake. Way of pro, well, never mind that, Zuni, he's getting jumped. Helisang's in trouble, he's down, but where is Power of Evil? Down to 50% HP. Omen of Death not been used yet as Huni is out to the background. Power of Evil's no, oh, no, Chachi. No, Power of Evil! Chachi was is out of position. Game? Steelback and Fnatic have found four. UOL had a terrible fight that lost them almost their entire team and should result in the match being over, and yet... Featherman continues to focus the turret. Hillisang is down. The Nexus turret is down. They're on to the Nexus. Fnatic look useless. like they're sudden. At 33 minutes, Fnatic are taking down the Unicorns of Love. No! A few more hits. No! Oh! What? What? I cannot! Somehow, right before their Nexus fell, Unicorns were able to respawn and kill off all of Fnatic getting a near clean ace. They were some 200 health away from losing this game, but now we're right back in it. UOL probably knew they had to be careful since Fnatic are no strangers to backdooring an exposed Nexus, but as long as they didn't make any more mistakes, they had a real chance of still winning this game. But that was when they made their next error. But they're going in again. Oh, that's a petrifying case. They've caught two. Power of Evil is down. That one was down, Hill though. And Chachi are trying to get away. We do see the Omen of Death. What can Power of Evil do from beyond the grave? He's caught steel back. But that, that is the most number of kills we've seen in the spring split. Fnatic just won another team fight that was a three for two, giving them a man advantage. And with the Nexus exposed, they could just run it down mid lane to try and win the game. UOL surely couldn't defend this for a second straight time, right? 14 minutes quicker than before. Yellow Yellow's star, the back door. Number. I've seen this before. It happened at Worlds and it didn't go in Fnatic's favor. Will their fate be different? Nexus is going the down. Go Hoonie. 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 Oh, no, 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 no. It's what Fnatic are cheering. We see Rain of his dad. It's happened again. again. Deficio, it's happened again. Right as Fnatic were about to win again, UOL stopped them, killing off their entire team and successfully defending their Nexus from Fnatic super minions. This team fight in particular was important for Unicorns, since Fnatic used their teleport that their top laner had during it, taking away any backdoor potential that they would have for the next few minutes. Unicorns of Love could now feel much more confident about trying to leave their base if they wanted to, and considering they had opened up Fnatic's inhibitor before they felt like an aggressive push for the win was the best move they could make. They were still behind in kills and gold even after winning these last two team fights, meaning they still had to tread very carefully, but they were so close to coming back from this near loss and winning what would be one of the most clutch moments in League of Legends history, they felt like they had to go for it. People, but Chachi forced to use that omen of death on himself. Double kill for Steelback. What can Feathervin and Steelback do? Vardax and Power of Evil alive. They do see the dredge light connects with Hillisack. Look at the carries. They're both rooted in place. Hourglass keeps Huni alive as we see Yellowstar taken out. This is a two, three versus three in the base. Feathervin is down. It is all Steelback and Huni now. And Huni, the Nexus is standing. Steelback has got Hillisack. He's critting massively onto Vardax. But Vardax and Power of Evil, they are pushing with the minions. Huni on full HP. Deficio, will they go in? Glacial Park. We do see the shard connect, but look at the auto attacks. Power of Evil's got him. Can Power of Evil turn around? Can he get Vardex? Vardex from Steelback. He can't Vardex find can Vardex. Steelback is looking for Power of Evil. Unicorns have done it. Unicorns have beaten Fnatic. It wasn't too long ago that League of Legends esports were completely dominated by one region and one region only. For a five-year stretch, from the start of Season 3 to the end of Season 7, South Korean teams won nearly every international tournament that occurred. Nobody ever came close to beating any Korean squad at the World Championships during that period of time, and even today you could argue that nobody comes close to the level of talent South Korean players seem to have. During that five-year stretch of dominance, though, there was one particular strategy Korean 
Korean teams perfected that allowed them to have such a stranglehold on the esports scene, which to summarize it briefly, it could be described as calculated aggression. Every time a Korean team was playing a match of professional league, they would seem to have this mindset of always looking for super aggressive plays, going for kills or objectives, and committing all their resources to doing so, but the catch was they would only actually go for a play if they were sure it would work. If a Korean team was looking at an opportunity that maybe only had a 60% chance of working out in their favor, or if there was a 50-50 coin flip and the enemy had just as good of a shot at coming out on top as the Korean squad did, well, then they wouldn't take those opportunities. They would just sit back and farm and wait until they had some play that was basically a surefire thing. This strategy was agonizing for anyone who ever rooted against a Korean team. What made the playstyle so frustrating was any team that went up against Koreans would never really seem that far behind at first. The scoreboard would be even in kills, you would rarely get more than one to two people getting caught out or killed at any given moment, and Korean teams would just seem be trying to chip away, getting small little victories that never seemed like that big of a deal. But while this might only give them a marginal lead at first, that lead would quickly snowball into an insurmountable advantage over time, leaving you hopeless by the final team fights that any sort of comeback could happen. Slowly bleeding you out until you couldn't fight back, that's what early Korean teams were so good at to a point that they almost never threw a lead once they reached a certain breaking point. Almost. Our next game I want to showcase comes from the world of Korean League, and is one of the most fascinating games I've ever seen. The match in question was Game 4 between sister teams Azubu Blaze and Azubu Frost in the OGN Champions Winter Playoffs of 2013. Now make no mistake, even though these are two Korean teams who do share the same sponsor, these squads could not be more different. Azubu Frost were the dominant force of Season 2 who were all but invincible. They were just coming off winning Champions 2012 Summer, which included beating their sister team in the process. They'd also gotten second at the most recent World Championship, and were quickly developing a reputation as a consistently dominant squad who would always show up and demolish everyone in their path. Blaze, on the other hand, were in a much different situation. They did manage to win a few of the smaller events here or there, but they were quickly becoming known as a team who was streaky at best, if not straight up prone to choking under pressure at worst. They failed to even make it to the World Championship, Frost almost won, and were coming off a 7th 8th place finish at the only major international event they'd ever attended, IPL 5, which was one of the worst performances by a Korean team on the world stage so far. With them being down 2-1 to one to Frost in this best of 5 series at Champions Winter, they felt like they were all but dead in the water, and the game started off exactly as you'd expect. And they may get him, man. Mission could be in trouble. He's going to need to get a perfect group prism. He hits Mad Life, has the flash, a flash from Mad Life to slow him down with Glitterlands, and Room gets the kill. And you know where he doesn't really have any worries in lane. Oh, Captain Jack has some worries out of lane, though. He gets in the arena, gets out. Here comes Requiem. Cloud Templar trying to pick up the kill, and he will. Azubu Frost did what they did best in early game, making calculated aggressive plays to get the first tower, the first dragon, and the first few kills. Blaze did their best to try and farm up in the meantime, but they couldn't ever do much to stop them. Frost continued rolling onward, getting more kills, more drakes, and more objectives in the dominating, soul-crushing way that talented Korean squads just choked the life out of you. By the 16 minute mark, the scoreboard was looking so ugly, I'm sure most solo queue teams would have a player calling for a forfeit at this point. Things continued to get worse as Blaze crumbled under the pressure of elimination. Frost got more picks, they got more dragons and more objectives until a breaking point occurred at the 28 minute mark. Operation Crazy Lulu coming in here. Nice Glitterland. Oh, what a great cataclysm. What a great wild growth as well. Meanwhile, in the back, Flame doing some damage to Rapid Star, but taking a lot in return. Shy jumping in. Here comes Requiem. Another kill for Rapid Star. Flame getting low. Helios as well. And it looks like it's going to be a really big win this time around. Here, 
Azubu Frost got a four for one team fight that blew the game wide open, allowing them to build up to a 5,000 gold lead and start taking inhibitors. Once inhibitors start falling, it becomes 10 times harder for a team to come back in a match, especially when you're playing against a season two Korean squad that just gave them a million more ways to put pressure on you. Frost continued taking Barons afterward, which then transitioned into taking more inhibitors, which then continued transitioning into choking the life out of Blaze until the 40 minute mark when they had nothing left on the map. Blaze just had their Nexus and two towers which remained alongside their inhibitors that would occasionally respawn every few minutes. Azubu Frost were now 8,000 gold ahead. They were super fed on every champion and they had taken almost every objective that there was. A fight right here should end the game. I think everybody's kind of in on that one. Inhibitor. It's back up, but not for long. Here's the run in. There's a wild drone. Welcome to the arena ambition. You're not going to make it out. I'm sorry. Captain Jack on the outskirts doing a lot of damage until Shy comes in, and he's going to chase that. There's Requiem. Will they be able to end the game right here? Woong. Actually, a bit of trouble here. Woong is not going to make it out. Oh, man. Look at that. I don't even know what why. What the world just happened? Wait, what just happened? Well, it turned out that Blaze somehow still had a bit of mental fortitude left. See, as far ahead as Frost might have been, two characters on Azubu Blaze were still doing pretty okay. Caitlyn, played by Captain Jack, and Rise, played by their mid laner Ambition, they weren't all that far behind compared to their counterparts. Both of these champions were actually ahead and creep score at this point, and were even when it came to itemization. Since these are Blaze's two carries, they could theoretically play play well enough to win some team fights, just if they made literally zero mistakes, that is. Still though, as the shoutcaster Doa says here, Frost are so far ahead, inhibitors are still dropping left and right, there's not really a way they can lose, which that's exactly what Frost were thinking as they pushed down again, trying to see if they could get a good fight to win the game once more. Kind of waiting for this last inhibitor to go down. Nice glitter lance, actually. Slowing down Captain Jack, forcing him to just be on their feet. Helios comes in right now. Can he get a good curse of that mummy? It's pretty good. Absolute zero coming down. It's right after the Zonius finishes. Oh man, instantly new graphic star. There's Requiem though doing a lot of damage to Azubu Blaze. And boom, getting chased. Captain Jack. Oh man, the damage from him. And Captain Jack takes on Woom. What is going on, Monte Cristo? Blaze managed to repel another Frost push, this time saving an inhibitor in the process. Blaze actually had a pretty good composition for what it's worth, and that's exactly what's allowing them to hang in here by a thread. Nunu is giving attack speed buffs to Caitlyn, synergizing perfectly as he's also comboing his AoE ultimates with a Mumu. Caitlyn and Rise are both really fed to a point that they're matching the damage output from Frost. If they can just keep their Nexus from falling, they have a legit legitimate chance to win. But still, look at this map. One slip up and this game is obviously over. Frost at any point can win a fight and finish the match. So of course they push down mid once more thinking third time's the charm. They just need one team fight to close out their victory. Now that all the inhibitors are up, there's actually a threat. Ooh, actually yeah. a super blaze. Oh, this is bad, bad, here comes. Shy coming in, there's the absolute zero. Can they get the win? Rapid Star getting very low as well. A kill already, Shy goes down. Can Captain Jack do it? There's the double kill. Can he continue? A Super Blaze Templar getting very low. I just said a Super Blaze Templar. There's a triple Jack kill. A triple. Oh man. At the 47 minute mark, when Blaze started a fight by getting caught out, they still managed to find a way to turn it around and win. Now, they had all three inhibitors up, giving them some more freedom to leave their base. Blaze used this newfound freedom to venture out and ended up taking a Baron, which started giving them some opportunity to look for a win themselves. Their base was still exposed though, and Frost knew it. As Blaze started pushing down mid to try and force a fight, Frost sent a few people to the top inhibitor going for a bit of a backdoor play. Blaze recognized it though, and sent a few people back just in time, which ultimately resulted in Frost scattering and Blaze got three kills. The match has gone on for so long at this point that Frost is stuck with some pretty long respawn timers. Right now, Blaze has an opportunity to go for the win. And so here we go. This is Coming so up close, man. Into the base. 
Both turrets are at full HP. Captain Jack is going to take gonna it. They're going to die Shirelli so fast. Captain Jack is just going to absolutely own this. Oh my god, Azumu Blaze is going to win game four! Oh man, Azumu Blaze coming back from three inhibitors now! Holy. Wins with the base trade, and we are going to the blind pick game, Monte Cristo. As great as those first two games were, there's one more that we have to talk about, which was none other than the greatest gold deficit comeback in League of Legends history. If you look at the matches we've gone over so far, you can start to get a feeling for what most high range gold leads look like. When Fnatic had a big enough lead that they nearly took down UOL's Nexus, they were ahead by 5.5k gold. When Azubu Blaze had lost every objective on the map and were behind plenty of kills, they were behind a about 8,000 gold at the worst. Generally speaking, that 7 to 8,000 range is the sort of upper echelon of what an insurmountable gold lead looks like. These deficits can still be overcome, as we saw with the Blaze and Frost game, but at that point, they're pretty rare. Back during 2018 Worlds, a Redditor analyzed all of the comebacks that happened at that international event and found that comebacks were virtually impossible past the 8,000 range. More specifically, he tried to quantify the probability of a team winning a match when they reached a certain gold lead and found that if your team had a 7,000 gold advantage, there was a 97% chance they would win. Keep that in mind when we talk about this next game. One of the greatest dynasties in League of Legends history was that of Moscow 5, a team that you know the story of if you've seen my documentary on them. If you missed it though, M5 were a dominant Russian organization from season two, known for not just being an impressive dynasty, but for inventing pretty much how we play League of Legends today. When you watch a match from the LCS, LEC, LCK, or any league across the globe, so much of what you're seeing was either created or perfected by M5, from lane priority to early jungle invades to lane ganking from other lanes, this was all stuff that M5 basically put into the game. Their rise came at a time when Pro League of Legends was a really slow and kind of boring experience. Most team played around lanes and just kind of had players 1v1 trying to out CS each other for a really long time, sometimes upwards of 30 minutes. So when Moscow 5 and their strategies of aggression and fast-paced gameplay came in, they were essentially 10 years ahead of their time in the meta and were able to dominate everyone they played against, except for one organization. CLG Europe were kind of the opposites of Moscow 5. They were a team that played so heavily into the idea of farming up their squad for the late game, they had kind of become the masters of it. They were unparalleled in their ability to stall out a match if they ever started losing and were one of the only teams that could successfully do that against Moscow 5. While M5 would usually still get pretty big leads on them in the early game, CLG EU could occasionally stall out the match long enough that they could hope for a late game turnaround, which leads us to DreamHack Summer 2012, where these two teams played against each other in Group B. Perhaps we should have known something was off when it was CLG who were the ones that got the first few kills and an early lead in this game. The match was off to a weird start and continued with a bit of strangeness, as M5 were the ones who were playing uncharacteristically slow. CLG had a 2-0 kill advantage as late as the 15 minute mark, but M5 came into their own before for long. What kind of preparation did you do? Oh, I to forget that because we are going to see the dive coming here onto Wicked. That ultimate from Vladimir does go in and it will finish him off. Actually, it won't because Diamond in the damage. But Corky will try to Valkyrie uh, in there and Yellow P is going to be finished off. And now Krepo is in all kinds of problems. Nunu ulti went off, and there is the double kill for Genja. This little series of skirmishes right here swung a gold lead into M5's favor that they would then build on and never lose for the rest of the match. All throughout the mid game, Moscow 5 would take objective after objective, dragon after dragon, get kill after kill, and were poised to snowball this lead into a victory. One particular decisive move seemed to seal the game at the 34 minute mark where it was here 
here that M5 had a great team fight, getting three kills, picking up a second Baron shortly thereafter, and extended their gold lead to 15,000. A 15,000 gold lead is incredibly large. Again, you have a 97% chance of winning with just a 7k advantage. This is obviously more than double that. Surely this match wasn't far from ending, as M5 then started knocking on CLG's door, trying to finish off the game. So it's here we go, the opener coming out. Crapo taken down very low, has to wish and keep it off. Alex Hitch has been taken down. Can he go on towards Frog? And the lay waste is coming to come down, but I think he might well get away with it. The ulti on Yellow Pete is going to survive as well. So actually a very good engage from CLG there. But they couldn't. M5 stayed in this position, looking down these inhibitor turrets for ages, but simply couldn't break them down for mainly two reasons. Reason number one, CLG is playing within Anivia, a champion who has an ultimate on a very low cooldown that does AoE damage, perfect for clearing minion waves. As long as Anivia clears these minions fast enough, there won't be anything tanking these towers allowing M5 to attack them. The Russian squad also didn't have a particularly great champion composition for taking towers and could only really get a few auto attacks in here or there with each minion wave. Anivia just turned out to be a real thorn in their side. The second reason for CLG's success was that Anivia was being played by Froggen the best Anivia player of all time. At the 43 minute mark, M5 would get an inner turret and ended up winning another team fight, taking down two of CLG EU's players. But interestingly enough, they wouldn't go and try and push down an inhibitor, even though they had a pretty good opportunity to do so top lane, they would go back for Baron, getting what would now be their third Baron of the match. This might seem like a mistake in hindsight, but can you really blame them? They are now up 20,000 gold. They might have have one of the largest leads in League of Legends history. Even with this new Baron buff though, M5 couldn't crack CLG's base once everyone had respawned. This was the old Baron buff, by the way, that just gave bonus AP, AD, and gold when it was killed. It did not give the minion buff that many of us are used to today, and with these minions still being so squishy and easy to kill, it was a piece of cake for Froggen to basically single-handedly defend CLG EU's inhibitor. We are now 51 minutes in, and M5 are taking their fourth Baron of the game. Look at the item difference here. M5 is now maxed out with a full six item set on every single champion except for their support, Nunu. CLG, on the other hand, just has two final items on some of their characters, one item on their support by comparison. M5 will likely never get a bigger advantage in this game. You can't really get a bigger lead than six items to three, to two, to one. M5 are now up 26,000 gold. This now is the biggest lead we have ever seen in League of Legends history. And so naturally, I thought about going for the go uh, ulti kick there onto him. Meanwhile, they're going to pressure it back. Darian taking the hits. Oh, Alex H is finally going to oh. go towards Alex H has been popped straight away. They're going to go towards Darian. You can see the pull rise coming down as well. The ulti comes out. Darian manages to pick up one kill. The ulti was cancelled. That ulti was not quite run through. Genja is going to get taken down as well. And CLG absolutely coming out on top of this one. It is going to be a two for one. Genja is going to go down. He will get popped. Now Diamond Pro is also going to go down. The wall goes across. Blocks them off. Beautiful play. Will they split off? They go towards Ghosty Pepper. Ghosty Pepper gets a double kill there as well. CLG EU got the perfect catch, executed a flawless team fight, and somehow managed to find a way to win and engage in spite of this deficit. They managed to defend their base against all the odds, and with a few of M5's characters down, they no longer had to sit passively hugging towers. Death timers are so long right now, with the match having gone on for nearly an hour, they can start roaming a bit more, and as soon as they started to roam, Oh, dead Alex H. Straight in there. Wow. Alex. Following this catch on Alex H, CLG EU took the first inhibitor of the game. That is utter insanity. Keep in mind, they are still 20,000 gold behind. All of M5 still has a full six items. CLG EU would need to have a miraculous team fight to win this match 
but you all know how this story ends. Looks going to get in there, but they've not got Genji. They're going to peel off. They've caught Darien out. Darien has to pull away from this one. He will back away. Can they finish off the Baron? The Baron was down to about 8,000 hit points. CLG going to have to peel off this one. Shirelli is rubbing pops. That goes Darien. Absolutely destroyed. Genja now he's the target as well. They're going to dive towards Genja. Then the kick comes out on towards Genja. Headbutt, sorry, pulverized. Alex is now the target. That is wicked picking up another kill. I cannot believe this is actually no. happening in front of me. No in in them. The Nexus story has already gone down. The second Nexus story has come down. And CLG pull off the oh. biggest comeback that we've ever seen in League of Legends at this level. CLG won the game and would later go on to win this whole event. League of Legends makes no sense.